Uh, how's it going? Good, good, working, clear, cool. Is that like it's going to fall off? Can't really see. Hi everyone, welcome to uh, our second committee talk of Focus um, from me, Will. I'm one of the events officers at Focus. I'll be talking today about experimental photography. I appreciate that term is quite broad, so I'm going to try and attempt to break it down into a little bit of the history, a little bit of what defined experimental photography at sort of its birth and where it is now in a digital age, um, because I think it's kind of so broad that we could consider everything today sort of experimental photography, but I'll get to that later about how we're there. Um, I'll also talk about a lot of iconic people who pioneered it and sort of how we get into the different eras of experimental photography, um, because we go from very early in the actual creation of photography up to surrealism. So I mean, maybe familiar with surrealism art, there's lots of painters who engage in surrealism, um, but actually photography was a great pioneer of it. So yeah. So, and thank you all very much for coming. So I wanted to start off um, with a quote by Man Ray. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar who Man Ray is, but he was a huge experimental photographer during the early 1900s. And I think his quote, I would photograph an idea rather than an object and a dream rather than an idea, is just a really good summary of this entire talk, I think, but also the whole concept of, there's a ladybird on my notepad, sorry. <laughs> it's really interesting. Um, I think this quote is really good at encapsulating basically this whole talk, because the whole idea of experimental photography, as I'm going to show to you, is that the whole point of it starting was to move photography into what we know it today as an art form. Because what you'll see at the start of this story, as it were, that photography was not seen as an art as it is today at all. It was merely a scientific tool or a technical skill that you learn purely to sort of observe, th observe things in science or physics, you know, the same thing, um, or as a reference tool for painting. So it wasn't considered an art by any means. So what Man Ray has quoted here, I think pushes it far into how we see it as an art, but also going further rather than defining it as just capturing objects in life for the sake of art, it's actually capturing dreams as he says. And that's the idea of trying to capture the abstract, which we'll get onto later as well. So first, I think it's best I try and define as broad brush as possible what experimental photography is. And there isn't an actual clear definition. And the ones that I found from various sources basically say it is this, defined as using non-traditional techniques upon photography, including digital editing, or in darkroom developments, or playing with the camera settings, which is more of a digital concept, um, or usage or making of art collages. So a lot of that relies on sort of post-production work, but there are a lot of things you can do, as I said, with digital cameras to change how the image looks before you get to editing. And before that, in the film age, it would have been darkroom developments and the ways you can change those. So that is the best sort of refined definition I could get of experimental photography. But you'll see throughout this entire talk that it's not quite as clear cut as even that. Um, there's quite a lot of change that goes on throughout it to make it what it is. So, no, there it is. <laughs> so, gonna start with this image. I imagine most of you may know who that is. If not, that is Abraham Lincoln, who once president of the United States. Um, and I'm gonna show you this second image. Now, does anyone hazard a guess, not Alex, because I know he knows, does anyone hazard a guess how these pictures might be related? Any takers? No, fair enough. So, this image is of a, another politician and statesman in America at some of the time, around the 1840s, called John C. Calhoun. And this is actually the original image. That image is sort of fake, but it is an edit. So, an artist by the name of Thomas Hicks in the late 1860s took this older image of John C. Calhoun and through developments using a very preliminary and larger and painting, painted over John C. Calhoun's face to make it look like Abraham Lincoln. Why? Not really sure. <laughs> Actually a defined reason why he did this. Um, but this is thought to be the first example of photo editing. Um, and people were managed to catch it out because famously, Abraham Lincoln had a mole on the left side of his face. And this image, it would be on the right side, or you can't really see it, but it's meant to be around there. And if you look throughout history, or anyone who might know about 
presidents. Um, Abraham Lincoln never had a portrait taken of him like this. He was very much against portraits that made him look quite sort of royal and powerful. He didn't really want that. Um, it was actually a huge thing to make him look good at all because apparently he wasn't a very good looking man. So yeah, this is the first edit we see in photography. Now a few other photographers at the time would have been doing similar things. Um, you see edits like this quite a lot in war propaganda at the time as well, using to make leaders or generals look more powerful by editing them in different powerful positions or just faking a general onto a soldier's face to make him look like he was at the battle at all. Um, so this kind of led me to question and others to question if this is where experimental photography begins. If experimental photography is changing an image, editing on it after it's been taken, um, then surely this is what this is. So maybe this is the beginning of experimental photography. Maybe it isn't. That has yet to sort of work out. So hopefully the rest of the talk and everything we'll talk about, well, maybe a clear idea of is what that is. So as I mentioned a bit before, one of the big questions for photography at the eight, end, sorry, end of the 1800s, early 1900s, was is it an art or is it just categorizing life? As I said before, photography at the time had been developed as a technique or skill to learn to aid in other things. If you're using it as referencing for art, um, so you could paint, or if you were using it to capture, binding, use it for biology, chemistry, to documents in science. So it wasn't really considered an art at all. And some of the people we'll talk about in a moment uh, were very much pushing for it to be an art. And there's a quote from a reporter during the early 1900s, Henrietta Klopath, who stated that there's, the fear has sometimes been expressed that photography would in time entirely supersede the art of painting. Some people seem to think that when the process of taking photographs in colours has been perfected and made common enough, the paint will have nothing more to do. Now, personally, that seems to be quite a bit of an extreme take, and one we now know is not true, because photography and painting are both equally appreciated. But at the time, it was quite a big problem for artists and scientists that they were worrying where's photography going to go. It was a brilliant innovation, but its path had not been defined, really. It was very much in a conservative way thought of as just a scientific medium. But you can see that that's actually starting to change around this time. So I want to talk about these two individuals, I'm going to move, and these two groups. So on the left here is Alfred Stieglitz, and on the right here is Henry Peach Robinson. Alfred Stieglitz was American, Henry Peach Robinson was English. Now individually, um, they set up two different groups. Alfred Stieglitz was based in New York, and over his 50-year career, he was a photographer himself, but he was also an art promoter. And he set up some of the first galleries promoting photography as an art. He set up a journal called Camera Works and only showed work that expressed photography as an art form, or what he considered photography to be as art. He very much saw photography as capturing ideas with a personal touch and the photographer's own character within them, not just simple frames of categorizing life. So the... New York Art Committee, I think it was the New York Art Gallery Committee, um, asked during, I believe it was the 1820s, not 20s, wrong time, 1919, asked Alfred Stieglitz to set up a gallery exhibition of some of the 10 best contemporary photographers he thought were the best at the time. And due to a lot of disagreements with the committee and himself, um, in terms of the creative direction of the exhibition, he decided to, as a method to bolster the numbers for support, as not many people thought how Fred Stiglitz did, he set up a group called the Photo Secession Group. And he did this, like I said, purely to bolster the numbers of people who supported him. And he made it an invite-only group to make it seem more private and luxurious, and that only a select few could see photography in this way. So he established the Photo Succession Group, and throughout their career, they were the first group in America to argue that photography was art, and it should be treated as a fine art, and that it shouldn't just be now capturing the everyday. We can take it away from that and start capturing the more abstract and artistic concepts. Now their English counterpart was the linked ring, which sounds a bit more kind of 
scary <laughs> photos of the session. Sounds a bit more like FBI, CIA, sort of. I don't know. <laughs> and that was set up by Henry Peach Robinson. Around the same time, I appreciate these dates are quite broad, but the groups were mostly only active between the 1880s and the early 1900s. And I know that the photo succession was set up around the 1920s, but the idea that Alfred Stieglitz and these group of people were pushing had been around longer than the actual group. It was only when photo succession started in the 20s that it was kind of capsulized into this one group. So the Link Ring was based in England, set up by Henry Peter Robinson. And they basically were advocating the same thing, but in England. He very much was for that photography should be an art as well. Now, he was a previous member of the Photographic Society of Great Britain, which was a extremely prestigious group at the time for photographers. But again, they were very conservative about the views and theories of it, and that it should be just for science, or at least as a technical skill, not an art. And Henry Pink Robinson completely disagreed with that. And he set up, again, an invite-only, very closed group of photographers to work alongside the photo session group to push photography as an art in the UK as well. He also set up a journal and he also set up a gallery called the Photographic Salon in which they held an annual exhibition that showed some of the best pictorial images in the UK. Now, I say pictorial. Um, Alfred Stieglitz was all for pictorial images as well and I'm going to explain what that is because these two and their groups were the key pushers of art photography and photography as an art as a whole but they weren't just pushing the idea of photography being an art it was actually the approach that photography took which was the first artistic movement of photography really these were just the groups that made it popular and that movement or approach was called pictorialism and it dominated photography during the late 1800s and early 1900s and it's not really defined in a very standard way it's mostly defined as doing something to an image after the fact which after the fact of taking it and as we said at the start that is kind of the very nature and broad definition of experimental photography so even though these photos might not scream experimental, they may just seem like portraits of everyday life. But for the time, what this was was strange. People weren't, or photographers, were not very much bothered about capturing people in everyday life. And especially ones with sort of colours such as this, the orange bromide type colours, very soft focus or very dark tones such as this. This was all artistically new and how it's very commonplace to us um, but at the time this was baffling <laughs> to a lot of people and so it's yeah it refers to a way that the photo has been manipulated in some way after it's been taken now Henry Feach Robinson showed photos like this in his annual publication and said they had a pictorial effect it's how it was referred to and it mostly began as a response again to the fact that photography should just be seen as a science and pictorialism as a movement in photography was started mostly by these two i don't know if you can see the names apologies if not david octavius hill and robert adamson now these were a photography painter duo so the photos were taken by adamson and octavius hill was the painter and when i say it seems weird to have a painter helping a photographer but these two link them very closely as many of the things in these images are actually painted over or superimposed with ink. So I believe one of them is actually where this woman's hand is touching the cage. So the woman in the image is, her hand is there, but this cage, I believe it's, according to how it was, was slightly over this way. It wasn't quite here. So this dark area that looks a little bit scratched up is where the cage edge would have been. And so it's been painted over and then repainted here and moved across. So it looks like that she's holding it and it gives it a bit of a new effect, meaning a bit more depth. And Henry Peach Robinson and Alfred Stieglitz were huge fans of these guys. Octavius Hill and Robert Anton set up one of the first photographic studios who dealt purely in art photography and published it. And they did a lot of this, I believe, in Scotland, in one village in Scotland. And I think the number was they produced over their time as a studio, something like 1,800 photos as a whole. All of just general life and the people going about their business. And so this was the first huge, big body of work 
of pictorialism photography and basically showing that, look, this is popular because people liked it as they sold these works as you know, monographs. They sold them as small pamphlets, not really as books. That wasn't really a thing. Even pamphlets were a very new change to photography, selling them as little things you could view um, or at least, well, they would have been big. So big pamphlets <laughs> like that. But uh, this was all very new to photography. So this is where we see sort of the first innovation of photography as an art. And I'll explain the processes that make these images look how they do and why they're different and why this was considered art photography more than just general street portraiture, which even would have been weird at the time anyway. So pictorialism had began the late 1800s and 1900s with mostly Octavius Hill and Adamson. But after their publication, that huge body of work and a select other photographers here and there, um, it spread hugely across large parts of Europe and into Asia as well. And what you'll notice, or what I'll talk about with many photographers I'm going to show, is a lot of their work and how they experimented with photography to advance it into pictorialism is actually showing a bit of the advancement of photography in itself in terms of techniques used, sort of artwork we see today and where it came from, and a bit of the, I don't want to say equipment, but accessories that we sometimes see with photography. So this first gentleman here is there <laughs> is Alvin Langdon Coburn. He was an English American pictorialism. He was one. He was the first person to actually develop the idea of abstract photography as a whole. Some of the first abstract pictures of sort of hexagonal shapes and weird superimposed prints were done by Langdon Coburn, and he was a member of the Photo Succession Group and one of the first original founding members and a close friend of Alfred Stieglitz. And he advocated again for pictorialism and that it should be the accepted photography style worldwide. And he also developed the first vortographs. I will show some images of what vortographs are later on. Um, but they are again sort of composed of kaleidoscopic images layered on top of each other to sort of form like a kind of dizziness effect. Of course, we have Henry Peach Robinson again. I could have put, a, put someone else on there, but he was there. And again, a hugely significant pictorialist. Third person here is Constant Poyo. He was a pictorialism photographer in France. And he was the leading French pictorialist. Um, he was also established as the chief theoretician at the French pictorialist movement photo club of Paris. And he produced a book as well called, I'm probably going to butcher this saying, Notes sur la photographie artistique is how I'm going to say it, <laughs> about how photography could be more than just science, it could be art. So you'll see a repetitive theme that they're all pushing for the same thing. And yeah, these two are Theodore and Oskar Hofmeister. They're German, again, pushing for pictorialism movement in Germany. Um, they were advocations of pic advocations? advocates of pictorialism, and they started a group called the Parasidium. So one thing you'll notice about a lot of these photographers as well is that they are establishing journals, some of them are establishing exhibitions, some of them are establishing groups that are usually invite only, but you'll see that they are attempting to establish institutions all over Europe and some of Asia eventually um, that are pushing for artistic movement of photography. And I know this seems like I'm moving into more history of <laughs> art photography, but it comes back around to experimental photography as this is where it was birthed because you'll see later that everything we kind of do now in terms of experimental photography is basically being done here by these guys and everything they vouched for and everything they experimented with. So the lady down here, this is Gertrude Kasaiba, or Kasaiba, apologies for butchering that again. She was a founding member of the Photo Succession Group and actually the first woman to join the Photo Succession Group. And she was a huge advocate for photography being a career for women which was quite strange at the time as well for a woman advocating for a new career path for women. And you'll actually see that sort of the subtext of a lot of this as well for photography is that it pushed a lot of movements as well, including feminism. And it was great for women as it was an, both an art form and a career they could go down. And at the time, there were not a lot of potentially profitable and careers that could make you very well known for women at the time. So photography was brilliant for that. And there were so many women that pushed it and did some very iconic work as well. And again, I'm showing another member, another member of that group. This is Anne Brigman, again, another founding member of the Photo Succession Group. And again, one of the first women to join it. 
she focused a lot on the female body and natural landscapes and she used techniques like super uh, imposing a lot and that was a very new technique and she was one of the first people to pioneer superimposing which is layering an image on top of another one not necessarily blending it into one image but to sort of as kind of edit or we would look at it now as like photo collages but they sort of come about as natural art form later on but she was one of the first people to do that and we also have photography spreading into Asia. This is Ogawa Kazuama, called Kazusama. He was a Japanese um, photographer, and he established the first color type printing business. So again, color type being one of these sort of precursors to film and like metal plate printing. Um, I'm not going to go too much into detail into it, but it was a kind of new type of printing for photography or development strategy. And Ogawa was one of the first people to develop factories that did that. And so again, you'll see that with this pictorialism art movement, it's actually pushing the development of photography as an institution and as respected art, setting up printing factories, setting up new types of camera techniques, etc. This is Nikolai Andreev, Russian photographer, and huge for the pictorialism movement in Russia, probably one of the only people doing it in Russia. Um, if you Google him and look at a lot of his images, he may come up as... Nikolai Andreyev or Andreyin. Um, I'm pretty sure it's the same person because all the photographs are the same, but nowhere does it say he had two names. Um, maybe this is my very poor research, <laughs> but it seems to be the same person. But you'll notice he was also a painter and he incorporated a lot of that into his photography. And he did a lot of pictures of Vladimir Lenin. So something I noticed. I put the question mark there because there was another photographer I wanted to talk about from Asia called Kojima Sebai and I wanted to mention him because you'll see in one of his images he was one of the first people to use superimposing in Asia but also um, add in aspects not just of abstract art and Brigman used a lot of abstract superimposing because uh, Seji used it in terms of adding other figures or sort of defined organisms or structures like a building or a plant or something over something uh, he also, and this is again coming back to pictorialism relating to the advancement of photography, he was one of the first people to use a magnesium flash. You know, in Victorian days they'd have like the thing they held up that sort of blew up, and that was like the flash using magnesium powder. He's one of the first people to use that. And he also experimented with x-rays, which I'm kind of not sure how that works, but he experimented with x-rays in photography and using oversized cameras to take oversized photos and really blowing them up large um, for some reason. <laughs> So this is just a sort of example of their work. So this is Alvin Langdon Coburn, and this is one of the vortographs I was talking about. So for a portrait of a gentleman like this, this would have just been completely baffling to people at the time. If you wanted a portrait taken of someone, you would assume it's for a journal. You want them to look very proper, official, and very well portrait and serious. This isn't serious <laughs> in my mind. Um, this is one of the first vortographs using a kaleidoscope effect to get that sort of dizziness feel. And like I said, Alvin Langkoba is one of the first people to make purely abstract photographs. I guess this is less abstract as you have a character, but he had other images that were like prisons and diamonds all sort of laid over each other and you can't quite tell what it is. So, yeah, a really interesting character. This is Constance Poyo's work. Um, a lot of these photos you'll notice have quite a lot of a dreamy effect to them. And I'm a really big fan of this one. Let's it in. This is Ogar was one of his first works in 1887. One of the only photos in pictorialism I could find that has colour. Um, and it seemed to me that uh, Asia was one of the first places that was developing colour film in terms of pictorialism, which I thought was quite interesting. And this is the question mark man, Sebi Kojima, who uh, I wish I'd found a photo of him, but I could not find a portrait of him anywhere. And this is what I meant by superimposing with actual figures that you can define. So if there is a crane big enough to carry a woman, I want to know where that is. But... <laughs> I doubt it. So, as you can see, the title doesn't really, not really, very descriptive. <laughs> um, but this is one of the first photos that uses an actual figure or a defined organism, a crane, superimposed onto original image. The original image is actually of this woman playing the flute, or this geisha playing the flute. And this crane, I believe it's actually a painting that is superimposed over it. So, one of the first examples of this, and again, in colour. Annie Brinkman's work, uh, again, taking a lot of photos of sort of the feminine sort of shape and women. I butchered that sentence. <laughs> Theodore and Oscar Hofmeister, a lot of their work was very grainy, quite black and white. 
Um, but all of this grain and sort of dark tonal effect in the clouds uh, was added afterwards. So again, making it pictorialist. Henry Peach Robinson's work. Um, I personally really like this portrait because something about it is really capturing. I don't know if it's her outfit or the scenery behind her, but yeah, I thought out of all of his work, I was really interested in that one. And this is Nikolai Andreev, but as I said, Andreev for some reason. Definitely the same guy. I just don't know. Two names come up. So I talked a lot about the actual photographers. I appreciate that. Um, but what makes their work actual pictorialism? What makes it different? What what made it different apart from you know editing? But what was it about the editing that makes it different? So the key process for a lot of them was the Bromore process. It's a variant of oil printing, and it allows prints to be enlarged further than they would be able to under an oil, oil, oil print process. And it involves taking the print and bleaching it in a solution of potassium bichromate. And bichromate, or sorry, bro, brom oil, is tends to be quite a dark, deep red color. Hence, a lot of those images that are done with the brom oil process are dark red, or at least a red color. And again, it makes this look like a painting, I think. I look at that and think that looks like a lithographic drawing rather than a photo, but it is a photo. And it's one of the, I think this image was by a photographer called R. Demarchi, who was a French pictorialist, and one of the first people to use the Bromore process in this way for portraits. And he was very much along the constant Hoyo pushing the idea that photography should be like art in the sense of painting, not just look artsy. It should actually look like a painting. So quite interesting. It also means that you can make the image larger so you get a bit more detail. Uh, but it also means that you get darker tones as well. So dark tones like this and very light tones like here, where it's nearly completely white, um, would have been quite hard to achieve in a normal oil print process. So yeah, quite interesting. Carbon printing. Um, it's an extremely delicate process, um, but it uses carbon black salt with other pigments and gelatin. And it gives you this really washed out silver effect. But in areas where it's dark, it's very dark. Um, but it gives you quite a lot of tonal variation. And that was the main point of this type of printing, was tonal variation. I appreciate this one's in black and white, but I imagine the original photo for this would have been in black and white, but because of Bromall, it's red. But you can see that the tonal variation from this compared to this is far less. Here, it's very much dark, light. This, you've got so many areas of gray and like different shades of black. Uh, this was one of the most popular processes for pictorialism, gum bic bichromate. Um, and this involved using Arabic, uh, Arabic gum and potassium bichromate, the same as here. Um, but in, ugh, using the Arabic gum on top of potassium bichromate, um, it allowed the paper to be pigmented first, and then you could add other layers of pigment on top of it. So it's kind of like a setting process. You'd use the gum to set the image in, and then you'd add other chemicals of whatever you wanted to add different tone and variation afterwards. It's different to carbon printing as carbon printing involved using one thing. Once the image was set, it was set. That's what you had. With this, you could kind of use the gum to start the image setting, which would allow for sort of these lighter areas. And then other chemicals on top allowed you to darken certain points with brush stroking over the top. So you'll notice that on this particular lady here, there's not really much detail of her dress, but it looks like brush strokes, or it looks like it's sort of been washed away, and the same up here. And that's likely because the original image probably only lit up this area. Everything else here was done with extra chemicals after gum by chromate had set in her face. And hence, they would have painted over it with various other chemicals to darken it, but it also gives it that painted effect as well. So it almost is like a predecessor to sort of if you're aware of film development, kind of the setting agent or chemical. I'm not as familiar with film, sorry. But it seems to be sort of a precessor to that. So we're kind of seeing again the advancement of film development in a sense. And for gum bichromate printing, uh, that would have taken several hours. <laughs> so a lot of these, it, however much it was a favorite of the pictorialists, it probably didn't produce a lot of work very quickly. Cyanotype was quite popular with early photographic processes, but it had a resurgence with pictorialists because they were really interested in deep blue tones. And I think 
during the printing process, like with gum bichromate, you would have the gum set the image and then you would add in cyan dyed chemicals that would give it this general blue tone. Um, and it purely was for the sake of it wanting to look blue. It doesn't really give much of a tonal variation apart from making the darks darker and blue. But apart from that, it just kind of makes the image look blue. But Victorialists knew it was different to what was being done already. It was some new colours and they wanted to go ahead with it. It didn't have much of a resurgence and past the Victorialist movement, you don't really see a lot of cyanotype printing as it is just kind of blue. That's the appeal. <laughs> blue. And then platinum prints or platinum type, extremely popular in photography, full stop. This was used in photography that covered science and as a technical skill as well. Um, but Victorianists took it and changed it a bit by using less of the chemicals that are involved. So first you sensitize the paper with iron salt and then expose it to your contact negative with light. And it generally forms quite a faint image and then you develop the paper chemically. And they messed around with how much chemicals, how much light was exposed with it, and it gives you this quite dreamy effect. And it's a very soft focus effect. Um, if you did it properly, it would give you very high, well, high enough definition um, to capture it as if you were using it for science. But Victorialists just mess with the process and it gives it kind of a new take. And then this is one of the final processes, oil printing. Oil printing was followed the platinum type printing process in that you would develop an image, but you would cease the process early, so darks were quite underdeveloped, and then you would paint over an image with kind of oil paint. Hence why this image looks quite crusty, if that makes sense. It kind of just looks, it's areas are in detail, but areas such as the darks, it, they just look a bit, I can't quite describe it, but if you can see what I mean, it looks quite crusty. It's the only way I can think to define it. But its main purpose was to define darkened areas, so, much of the shadows here, this boy's coat or shirt, areas of hat, and even like shadows under hats, you can really tell them. And even shadows over the face, like under eyelids, you can really see them quite clearly. And that was the main point of this. So, the Dada movement. So, pictorialism ended around the sort of late 1910s. Um, and it kind of was the sort of birthing ground for this next movement. Some of you may have heard of this, some of you may not. Um, Dadaism. Now, Dadaism was a post-World War I art movement that was, um, well, not post-World, well, not quite post-World War I. It started during World War I, but grew more post-World War I. And its whole artistic movement philosophy was that it was anti-establishment everything. It was almost anti-art <laughs> to a degree. It was anti-bourgeoisie regime, anti-monarchy, anti-capitalist. It was just anti-establishment as a whole. It was pushing for the idea that they wanted to represent the absolute chaos that the war had brought. And so with it, they kind of made their art, art purely chaotic, nonsensical. Um, but it was art in form of poetry, it was writing, it was acting and performance, and it was also photography. So all of these works are one, work by Hannah Hock, extremely famous Dada artist, and one of the first female Dada artists to be involved with Dada. Dada started in Zurich during 1916, and she was the first woman to be begin doing it for well, actually, I think the first woman doing it in Zurich at all, and hence where it started, so one of the first women involved. And she basically invented the photo collage, so if any of you have ever been on holiday, been to an event, used some sort of digital program to create photo collages, that whole idea and concept, you have Hannah Hock to thank you. And a lot of the work, as I said before, oh look, there's the ladybird, sorry. <laughs> A lot of the work, as you can see, is very politically motivated. Um, I haven't shown it big, but this is probably her most famous piece. The name is extremely long and I cannot remember it, but all of it was to push for the idea of chaos, nonsensicalness. Um, but a lot of it was to also mock the establishment. It's, especially in this image, it's mocking war, mocking politicians, mocking the reasons for war. But it also was breaking boundaries in terms of gender identities. 
and also the feminist movement as well. So images such as this would have been quite imposing at the time, especially in publications in various art magazines in which they were published in. Um, I have a couple of more images of Hannah Hock's work here as well. Um, towards the later years of Dada, she moved a lot more into colour. And so a lot of these images are a lot more colourful. Uh, this is another Dada artist called Max Ernst. And again, very much a lot of colourful collages. Max Ernst was very big on photo collage, but he also engaged a lot in pictorialist photography. Is A little bit of the problem with this is that a lot of these stages of experimental photography kind of blend into one. Um, Dada is informed out of pictorialism, but a lot of Dada is an art is also pictorialist. It's more like pictorialism is a huge category, and then Dadaism is a huge category, and they're sort of brackets that envelope each other. But many artists, or at the time, would have said, I'm not a pictorialist, I'm a Dadaist. So there was lots of conflict between groups, even though they might have all been in the same bracket, that they oh no, I'm this, I'm that, I'm not this, I am that. So it's a bit of a jumble and really based on your personal opinion of what you are, depending, regardless of what art you make. So um, an iconic Dardais who we quoted at the start was Man Ray. Man Ray was making a lot of photo collages as well, but a lot more minimal to Hannah Hock. So this being one image, this being the other. And we'll talk about Man Ray later because he comes a lot into another photography movement. He just kind of was everywhere. And... He was a very good start artist. Erwin or Jan Bloomfeld. Um, Erwin Bloomfeld was their birth name, but they went by Jan Bloomfeld as their Dada name. Um, this would have been considered Dada art because this mirror shot is superimposed on this shot. So this is one image of Audrey Hepburn. This is a mirror shot, which was a separate shot. And then that composite shot has been copied up and up and up. So technically a Dada technique of superimposing and collaging, but Jean Blumenfeld, as they would have gone by, was one of the first people to move Dada art into fashion photography and commercial photography. So a lot of this, and again, done quite a lot later past the Dada movement, 1952. Again, coming back to the problem, actually again, Man Ray, 1936. Again, a lot of problem. Many of these artists still called themselves Dada, I assume that the Dada artists, the era would have ended. So it's a little bit confusing, but we're still on Dada. So this is one of the first examples of it moving into commercial work. And actually it's thought that Erwin slash Jan Blumfeld was the, most, the highest paid fashion photographer ever, apparently. I mean, I have to account for inflation. But at the time, they probably would have been one of the most expensive photographers as well. So, oh, this is some more of Jan Blumfeld's work. And again, even though it's in the 40s and 50s, we are seeing a lot of Dada trends again. Um, this would have been this is a promotional poster for uh, I think it would have been I'm not sure what film it is, but it uses the imagery of Charlie Chaplin and but includes Dada themes of photo collage. This is a very nice portrait that I liked. That I really enjoyed the lighting about. So coming back to Man Ray, Man Ray kind of carried on what Alvin Lang Coburn started with vortographs, but he made his own version, which were rayographs. And he would have been one of the other huge artists who pushed photography purely in the abstract sense. And this very much follows pictorialism ideals in that it's art, but it also is so out there that it is, it's art photography, but even the subjects are hard to even define. So he called these rayographs, and they involve taking photographic paper and laying items on top of them, and then exposing them to light or indeed the sun sometimes, which is light, you know, big light. <laughs> so, and you would have had different effects with doing it with artificial lighting in the sun. So if you were doing it with the sun, you get quite a lot more scorched effects like this. And if you're doing it with artificial light, you get quite, I'm going to walk over here, soft effects like this. And if you move the item, you get this kind of double exposure look. And a lot of these would have been a photographic paper exposed to one thing, then you add another thing on top, expose that later, and that would have given it a more faded out, darker look, and then so on and so forth. And then you could either superimpose those over another piece of photographic paper. So you could really go quite crazy, and Man Ray did. <laughs> there are, these are only three, there's probably like a thousand of these. He did loads of these, and these were a lot of art he was known for. 
And Man Ray will come up here and there again because he's such an iconic character in both pictorialism and Dadaism. And a lot of people, I mean, I'm not sure about you guys, but he's quite a famous name for me as well in that so many people look to him as one of the godfathers of art photography. And indeed, and I haven't said the word in a long time, experimental photography, because this was not traditional photography, even for the 40s and 50s and 30s. This was extremely out there. This was a completely new process. And it harkens back to that theme of experimental photography, actually advancing photography as a whole into completely new areas. This is just one of Man Ray's iconic images. I don't really want to pronounce that because I fail or butcher it and offends people. So we'll go with the English. English's violin. This is made in 1924. So this was coming towards the end of the Dada movement. But I wanted to bring up this image because it's one of his most famous Im images taken by photographing this lady here. And these uh, F holes that you see on the violin um, were actually painted on. They were, I think they were painted on separately, photographed and then superimposed on that. So he didn't mess up painting on the actual image. And I want to bring this up because this, even though we may have seen images that are somewhat similar before, this is kind of a tipping point now from Dadaism. After the war, Dadaism kind of dispersed as many of the artists went back to their home countries. Dadaism focused on certain places and artists congregated, so Zurich being one of them, Paris being another. America less so, and England less so. It was mostly in Europe and Berlin as well. And after the war, Dada artists sort of dispersed and Dada as a whole kind of died off. But artists like Man Ray in America, um, eventually moving to France, um, still pioneered it quite a lot. But it's this time that we come to the end of Dada and we're actually getting a change in philosophy of photography. Everyone still believes that photography should be an art and that it should, I mean, at this point it kind of is, and that it should push boundaries and attempt to make new ideals for photography, new techniques, and more out there and wild images. But this is well where we're moving away from it. And actually, this would have been an example of combination printing, like I said, as this was taken, this was painted, then an image taken, then superimposed on that. This is combination printing, as much as photo collage. So yeah, <laughs> this was the main problem with Dada. There was too much art. Dada was very much anarchic in nature, in that it wanted to go against everything anti-establishment. And that's all well and good, but it's not all well and good when you kind of don't have a point anymore. If your point is just, I would want to be anti-establishment, but you don't have any sort of programmatic approach, you don't have a way to structure your movement, you don't have progression. And so, hence that sentence sums up, there's no systematic theory to support itself with Dada. It didn't have an actual theory apart from just we hate everything. Actually, I don't even like this art. I want to make random photo college art. And that was a huge problem for this man. This is Andre Breton, a French poet, journalist, and photographer himself. And these quotes kind of sum up very much what he thought of Dada, in that Dadaism cannot be, saved, uh, cannot be said to have served any other purpose than to keep us in the perfect state of availability in which we are at present and from which we shall now depart all lucidity towards that which calls us now. And we have never regarded Dada as anything but a rough image of a state of mind and it by no means helped to create. His idea, and he wrote that sorry, in literature, which was his own journal at the time. So Dada was so nonsensical and had no point to it in Breton's eyes that he thought the photography should become something a lot more structured, which kind of goes back to the whole point of experimental photography. Uh, experimental photography wanted to move away from having structure to the point where we got to Dadaism. But now Andre Breton wants to move it back into structure. So how can that be achieved and still be experimental if you're kind of going backwards on yourself and trying to give photography more of a sort of structured meaning? But he found a way around it. So if any of you have heard of surrealism, this guy basically started surrealism. Surrealism um, basically being the idea that it follows pictorialist ideas and that photos are still edited and the photos should still be considered art and that it should still go against establishment. But Breton wanted surrealism to follow almost psychoanalytical work, if you're familiar with Sigmund Freud, diving into the subconscious. Let me close back up. 
This was his manifesto he post published called the Manifesto of Surrealism. And in it, he describes photography should be chasing the subconscious, chasing everything that we want to see the world as, not how it actually is. And of course, a lot of photographers are already doing that, but he very much wanted it to be based on just, it's very hard to describe, it's almost manic. And I guess that kind of harkens back to Dadaism, but he thought, no, it should be established by select photographic groups and they should produce annual exhibitions and these exhibitions should follow the movement of surrealism. And so the benefit of establishing your own ideal photography in that it should be following the unconscious, diving into almost psychedelic forms of imagery, um, and you being the only person who's written about that means you can masthead it and it's completely under your control. And so Andre Breton had a lot of arguments with a lot of photographers about what photography should be. He very much advocated it should be nonsensical to the point of going deep into the psyche, whereas many photographers wanted even a bit more structure. He thought he was giving structure to photography by saying that, but to me that kind of seems even further than Dadaism. So this is kind of the philosophical journey we're following with photography at this point. It's kind of gone sensical to less sensical to complete nonsensical to apparently more sensical, but even further nonsensical. So originally surrealism was a literary movement. It started with poetry and a lot of it was defined in the Manifesto of Surrealism. Um, but it moved into photography and I'll show you some of the photographers who followed surrealism, hopefully attempt to explain it a little more. So one of the first photographers who started doing this was Eugene Agedet. He um, started around the 1870s, he was born in 1857, French, based in Paris, and actually knew Man Ray at the time. And he didn't consider himself as a realist by any means, he just thought he was capturing life as a street photographer and a documentary photographer. Um, but a lot of these images are the basis for the surrealism ideal. I can't personally always see how, <laughs> but to surrealists they thought he was capturing the subconscious of what people see on the street and the madness of how we view the world. I semi see it in this image. This image is of people looking at a solar eclipse. It's kind of ironic that he's taking a photo of a people looking at a solar eclipse, not taking a photo of the solar eclipse. It would have been hard, but I suppose the point is more that you're looking at the thing you shouldn't be looking at. And so for surrealists, even though Eugene thought he was simply capturing street photography, even though the look of them is quite dreamy and very much in that pictorialism vibe, to surrealists this was quite moving. They thought these images were looking into the deep psyche of female dress wear and, you know, how women should dress themselves and how do we see them on the street and how do we view them in society because you can see those buildings reflected in the window and there's double exposure and quite a lot of weird BS meanings on top of it. Um, but again, they also thought that he was capturing what people should, shouldn't, sorry, shouldn't be looking at, which I guess this image defines quite well. So I understand that part. But yeah, for surrealists, these were a lot of the starting images that pushed surrealism to what it is later. These I see less sense in because it just looks like street photography. But to surrealists, this was apparently very moving and meant a lot. So for surrealists, it kind of moved away from photography and more about philosophy in that they thought photography was definitely now an art and it should explore the subconscious and deeper meaning. I suppose now when you go to art galleries, you can see a lot of that in that you see images posted up and they've got plaques with long paragraph descriptions of what they mean, whereas you might not be able to see it. And all of that is in the, in the name of surrealism. And that whole sort of institution at art galleries of explaining images so deeply comes from surrealism. This is personally one of my favorite photographers, Dora Maar. She was an iconic surrealist photographer. Um, one of the mistresses to Pablo Picasso as well. And she was a huge fan of superimposing. This is personally one of my favorite images. Just so nice to compose, I love it. Dora Maar was an iconic surrealist photographer. And she moved more into painting in her later years, but was very much an advocate of exploring subconscious. But she also, a lot of her work moved into commercial work. So this image, for example, was the face of a fashion, popular fashion magazine in Paris at the time. And I can't quite remember if this is Dora herself or one of her friends. But as you can see, superimposing is happening, cutting of the film of this being a separate image from some other place. This hand is also superimposed as well, which is kind of odd because you can see that that could be this woman's hand reaching over. I find it quite odd. 
So Dora Maar, huge influencer on surrealism photography and has an absolutely iconic photos, again, using superimposing and photo collage. But Dora Maar also pushed a new technique for surrealism, a fairly new technique, and it's as simple as cropping or perspective warping. So this is Pierre Ubu, and for those you might recognize, all that is, is a baby armadillo. Now I think she captured this in a jar in formaldehyde, so a bit grim at the end of the day. But now I've seen this image in real life, and it's looking at it as well here, it's one of those images that so the original image is a lot larger, there's a lot of empty space, and there's quite a lot of sort of chemical space, um, as in you can see like chemical ripples on the bottom. The actual image that is shown is cropped and cut. And I think just by doing that cropping and cutting and a little bit of perspective changing, you it gives the image a new meaning. I don't know about you guys, but even though you know it's a baby armadillo, it looks quite weird. It's quite alien and ethereal. And it the longer you look at it, you think, I know it's a baby armadillo, but something about it looks just too much alien or ancient, maybe not, but for you guys, but a lot of reviews and a lot of critics say that's the feeling it gets. And Dora Maar was really popular with just taking an image that originally was much larger and perhaps not that iconic in its original state and just simply cropping or moving certain sections by cutting the film and superimposing it a little sort of further down the film. And it creates complete new images. I think Pierre Rubu is a really good example of that, even though it is just an armadillo at the end of the day, but it it's more the feeling it gives you. And that's what surrealism wanted. It wanted you to feel something that made you think and made you feel disturbed. And it was all about invoking feeling and making you think and making you dive into your subconscious about, well, what do you link this to? What are you really thinking about? Why does this look like an alien to you? What does that mean? Are you thinking wrong? You know, questioning personality. Yes, yeah, deep. Morris Tabard is another iconic surrealist photographer. A lot of his work was very much commercial. This being one of them, a face of a, I believe it's a German fashion magazine that this was featured on. And again, a lot of double exposure and superimposing a lot of his work. I particularly like this image quite a lot. I just like the tree and how it looks like it could be a dress pan. Um, I will talk about these two effects later because this, again, with other artistic movements in photography and experimental movements, I suppose, experimental photography also advanced techniques in photography. These two techniques, as much as there is double exposure and superimposition going, use a technique called solarization, which I'll talk about a bit later. Um, another question for the room. Does anyone know who this image and who actually in this, who the person in this image is? Or any idea? Does anyone know who painted that? Yeah? Yeah, Rene Magritte. So I didn't know this either. René Magritte was quite a big surrealist photographer as much as he was a painter. This is the Son of Man, his most iconic painting, in my mind anyway. But he was actually quite a big surrealist photographer. His breadth of work was not as big as his painting, but he produced quite a lot of superimposed and photo college art. And he was a huge fan of Man Ray and a huge support, supporter of Andre Breton, actually one of the key figures Andre Breton consulted when starting up surrealism movement and its approach for photography. So I just thought it was an interesting little tidbit of information. So again, come back to the techniques um, with other pho photographic movements, surrealism advanced a lot of different techniques in photography. And actually that was one of the big things surrealism advocated in that photographers should not just be taking photos to make meaning, they should be doing anything in their power to change their technique, change photography, and change how they do it to create new and emotional, emotional invoking yeah. words. So as I said before, solarization or the Sabatia effect is one of them. Now, in photography, it describes tone reversal in that the areas that should be dark and are light and areas that are light should be dark. You can quite easily do this digitally by simply bringing the dark tones completely up. That's how you get a very basic solarization or Sabatia effect. The spatial effect is a little bit different in that it's pseudo solarization in that the photography or the image, um, the actual negative is reversed due to chemical process. So solarization involves a chemical process after developing the film to give it this effect. The spatial effect basically involves incorrectly developing the film so that you have the same effect. 
So basically one and the same. Double exposure, um, this may be something that's familiar to a lot of people. Maybe you guys may use it yourselves in digital editing. It's very easy to do now. Simply make one image transparent, layer it on top of another, or cut one into another. But it was huge in the Surrealist movement and actually was pioneered quite a lot in the Surrealist movement, again, by people like Dora Maar. So double exposure, simply involving layering one piece of film onto another, and then perhaps taking, retaking a photo of that, cutting that as its own image, or simply just layering two prints on top of each other, chemically developing them, and then they bleed into each other, and you have a double exposure. Um, for Surrealist, it was a way to show one place, two things. So one place has two meanings. Um, well, that was their philosophical approach to it. And then other approach is brûlage or burning. And as it says, you know, there, it literally was burning the film. When you put harsh light onto the film or the emulsion that the film is being and heat it up, it causes this really wavy effect that, as you can see here, just makes the whole figure look distorted. And you can kind of see areas here where, so the actual figure is standing upright, but the effect has waved her and made it look like that. But you can see the effect spreading to the rest of the film. It uses these lights effects. So again, it's to capture that whole ethereal, transcendental look that Surrealism went for quite a lot. Ah, combination printing. Now this is actually an image by Henry Peter Robinson from the Victorious Movement. As combination printing was being used there, but far less so than it was in Surrealism. Um, might as well ask it as another question. What do people think... So this photo is not one photo. How many photos do people think this is? As in combined? No. Three? No? It's actually seven. <laughs> That's actually seven images. I think, if I can remember the diagram, this is one, this is one, this is one, this is one, that's one. I can't remember where the others were. It might be the chair. It might be this, because this is quite lit up. Either way, the point is that um, combination printing was cutting various prints together to make one image, um, usually to make the image have more meaning in that you can it's basically faking it, in a sense. It's basically making an image seem more capturing than it actually is to give it a lot more deep of meaning. And the combination of printing like this um, came from the idea of pictorialism that moved more into surrealism. You know, they wanted uh, photographs to be more like paintings. So paintings, especially in the surrealist movement, were very much nonsensical, like a lot of René Magritte's work. And photography wanted to try and capture that, and its main method was combination printing, taking completely unrelated images, combining them into one, and you can make it look like a completely fantasy type scene. And of course, we have photo montage, which is probably something I should have mentioned back in pictorialism as it was still happening, but, and even Dadaism. But surrealism, again, pushed for a lot more of photo montage, and that's simply taking film, cutting it up gluing it onto more film, and then processing that, um, or simply superimposing things over each other. And Dora March being popular for that, but we've also seen people like Man Rain, a lot of dart artists doing that as well. But yeah, it's really popular technique. So past pictorialism, dardaism, and surrealism, surrealism kind of continued up into sort of the 60s and 70s. Um, it mostly stopped during the 50s. And this was mostly with the death of Andre Breton. Um, one of the problems about being a figurehead of a movement is that when you die, because there was so much arguing in surrealism about what people thought it should be and that we shouldn't be looking too much into meaning, we should be just trying to make abstract art and a lot of people disagreeing with Andre Breton's ideals, uh, the issue is that when you die, the movement kind of dies with you. So after Andre, De Andre Breton's death, I believe in the 60s, um, surrealism kind of died off. A lot of the paintings, a lot of the images are still very iconic and people still practice realism today. Um, but as an entire art movement and as an ideal that this is the way photography should be full stop, it kind of died off. So the next sort of biggest development in terms of technique and things that we see in photography 
are hemograms. And these were developed in the mid 70s by <laughs> Joseph H. Newman. And this is the process of taking an image, enlarging it on photographic paper in the darkroom, and then selecting certain areas of it and exposing them to more light so that they are lit up like this, uh, and then painting over it. And again, it is a way of producing images that are quite ethereal and dreamlike. Susanna Rankatis, I'm going to say it like that way, apologies if I'm doing it wrong, she focused a lot on her microscopic imagery. So some of these are micrograph images that she then double exposed, exposed to brighter images, and then also painted over them with fake color. And uh, I think they're quite, that one gives off more of a surrealism vibe than this one. This one gives off more sort of scientific micro, micro, micro photography <laughs> way. So again, you could see it as maybe a step back towards the science like stems of photography, um, but it's also moving it in a new artistic direction. So I'm going to talk a little bit about so those are mostly pictorialism, Dadaism, Surrealism are the big movements of experimental photography. I hope I've done decent enough in explaining that there was an evolution in that they, from pictorialists deciding that photos should be edited and changed to represent something new other than just capturing life, to going quite far down the line to Dadaism in that it was a, a whole art movement, but photography, it was a complete rejection of the norms and what should be done in art, as well as and the establishment, completely going against every trend they could, to coming back with some sense of order according to Andre Breton and surrealism, but really going even more extreme and ridiculous. And it's almost after we reach that point, and after Andre Breton's death and the death of surrealism, that people have kind of not fully discovered, but opened their eyes a lot more to what photography could be. It wasn't just a science or a technical skill to learn to just capture life. It was now an art, and you could do so much with it, with all these different techniques that we've discussed. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the equipment that came along with that, as I said. Experimental photography has also been big in experimenting with the new equipment. Photography came with lots of new equipment as it advanced, and that also advanced how people took photographs. Many unique different processing types, ways of processing, equipment to process and enlarge, and especially cameras, although I'm not going down the rabbit hole of cameras because we'll be here all night, so I'm not. <laughs> but I'm going to talk about some of the more iconic things that did come about that changed up photography in a more sort of modern age, postmodern. Um, one of the big ones is the fisheye lens. Fisheye lens was developed in the 1920s by Robin Hill, who wanted to create a lens with an 180 degree coverage to look at clouds for a cloud survey. And it's mostly used by scientists and meteorologists. Um, they had been developed as early as the 1880s, um, but the modern sense of fisheye lenses that you could buy now to add into your camera weren't really a thing until the 20s. And even then they were still quite limited. Um, but fisheye lenses are used a lot in music photography, albums, uh, editorials, various things, and it became huge with post-punk and punk rock in the 80s, and then really big with hip-hop in the early 2000s and 90s, used a lot by Busta Rhymes and Missy Elliott in both music videos and album covers. So you may know Harry Styles' album. This isn't the actual album cover, because every time I tried to get the album cover, it came up really crusty and pixelated. Um, so if you know the Harry Styles album, you know, this is one of the editorial shots from it, though. And again, the use of a fisheye lens. This is on a film camera, a medium format film camera as well. So to capture that level of detail with the fisheye effect is quite cool. And of course, iconic Jimi Hendrix album, again, using the fisheye lens. Why it became so big in music photography, no one really knows. It's mostly following the line to try and make your work different. Lots of albums were, if they were photographed, they weren't too much on the experimental side as we discussed. And I think this was kind of a movement into that to try and make things a little different. And of course now you see it and you think, oh, that's cool, but it's kind of a norm now. Everyone, like a lot of artists did it. Harry Styles indicating that. And the modern artist who used it for their album release. But it was quite a big development during the early 1800s, but more in the 20s when it became more of a consumable. Microscope cameras. I know this is quite niche, but I think it, it's quite interesting how 
we talked about photography starting as something to capture science, going very far into the abstract and the arts as well. Um, but obviously there's still a use for cameras in science. It's still used very heavily in lots of different science. But mugshot cameras can also be used to capture scientific, or what we, sorry, what we see under a microscope in the sense of art, and abstract. So the type of photography that uses microscope cameras is called photo micrography. I have to read that because I can never get that word right. And it's thought to be invented by William Fox Tauber, who developed the first calotype process. I did mention calotype a bit earlier with a pictorialist photographer, Okagawa. I can't remember the second name, but <laughs> one of the Japanese pictorialist photographers who developed one of the first calotype factories. And this was the precursor to the modern photographic film development photography uh, Right, film development process we know today. Um, and yeah, microscope cameras first to be thought developed by the guy who invented those, William Fox Talbot. And they originally looked like that, which I imagine is a bore lake to set up. <laughs> so they're very much advanced now, the image you saw beginning with. So that would have been one of the first um, microscope photographs. And because of the tiny aperture you would have been getting because obviously looking through a microscope the object sorry the eye lens i'd study zoology i should know some of these terms <laughs> um you would have had a really small aperture so taking a photo you would have been sat there for half an hour or a very good few tens of minutes waiting for this photo to imprint onto the metal plate that you had because you had such a small aperture and such small light to be able to capture these things that were so small um but like i said it moved away well, it has now, in the digital age, moved away from being the reason photography was invented for science, and now it can be used for abstract photography art. So for things like this, you may be able to recognize it's a flower, but it still has a very artistic look to it. I think, I have no idea what this is. Some sort of microorganism, clearly. <laughs> but if you were, you know, you could be completely unaware of what that is, that it's any sort of organism, you could like, Oh, how did they get that painted effect? Or how did they make the hair look like that? Or how are they getting this weird lighting effect? This is really skilled painting. You could think this is a painting, perhaps. But it's just interesting the way that the reason photography started has now gone to the thing that people argued it shouldn't be, art and abstract. So quite interesting. Um, I'm also going to talk about multi-lens cameras. Really what I should be talking about is uh, 3D stereoscopic photography which was layering images on top of each other and usually having them perceived from two lenses and you, or you could hold it up to your face and it would give a 3D effect. And this was first invented by Sir Charles Wheaston in 1838. Stereograms, so two offset images that you kind of looked at like that and they would appear 3D when you looked at them together because your brain would connect them and line them up. But since then that has advanced a lot to cameras and multi-lens cameras. So I mentioned this one, which is the Nashika 3D N8000. Um, this was invented in 1990, it's annoying, I can't remember the date. <laughs> 1989, never mind. <laughs> this was invented in 1989, and it has four lenses that are actually um, not much glass. There's one piece of glass. It's mostly plastic, which is odd. Um, but the benefit of this camera is that when you layer the film on top of each other, you can get effects, and usually when you digitally edit them, like that. So some of you may have seen images like this, and I suppose these are more popular as GIFs, but it's interesting you only get these images when you lay the film on top of each other. And of course, back when the stereoscopic cameras would have been first been invented, back in the 1830s, they wouldn't have looked like this, but layering at least up to two or three images together putting them side by side and having some sort of device in which you could hold them up to your face, your brain would be able to align them and they look 3D as if they were coming at you or moving. And it's interesting to see how photography has advanced to be able to create images like this. And again, I'm not counting this as like film or moving image because it's only moving because of three or four individual pictures. Of course, there's a digital aspect to it, but this is still the advancement of photography in a sense. So even as late as the 1980s, photography is still pushing itself to advance and trying new methods to make it more abstract and artistic. Um, I suppose this blurs the line with moving image a little, but to me it's still photography and it's still following that aspect of surrealism to a sense that now the image isn't 
just trying to give you more meaning. The image is actually performing in a sense. So, yeah. And then I think one of the best parts about photography is weird cameras. Maybe one of the best ways to create experimental photography is not to take photos with a traditional camera at all. So cameras advance and have new methods in how they take photos, but some cameras will never be able to capture some things the way they do. So it sounds like a tangent, but I promise it will come back to it. So if you might be aware what a pinhole camera is, pinhole camera it tends to be simply a box that's got your film or your metal plate with your film on the back of it and a single hole with a tiny aperture. If you're taking a big scene, you'll be stood there, kind of like microscope photography, for about half an hour, because you've got a tiny hole, small aperture, a very small amount of light is touching your film. You need to wait ages for it to develop. And it's very good at capturing just very quick one shot or one moment in time, because that'll be the only thing it sees briefly and is emblazoned onto the image. So if that's the basics of a pinhole camera, any ideas what that might be? <laughs> Not quite the opposite. No? So think of that as the extreme, in that this is a camera made up of 32,000 drinking straws. Each one acts as a pinhole camera. <laughs> so behind this, there would have been a large piece of film. And a, I believe the way they described it is that there is a moving, basically, shutter underneath this that opens up. And then all of these 32,000 straws act as a pit large pinhole camera. It was developed by Mick Farrell and Cliff Haynes in 2007. And they went with the concept that they could, if a pinhole camera creates one image that is whatever shape the pinhole is, tends to be hexagonal, um, you usually get a hexagonal shaped image that is completely ended where the pinhole ended. So if you can have a camera that combines all of that, Surely you'll get images that kind of look like cubist or yeah, cubist art in that they look very segmented. And they do. And yeah, I don't think I've ever seen photos like this before. <laughs> and so again, it's the whole thing that exploring experimental photography and seeing how far you can push the limit of photography and what you can do with it will generate new images. I mean People have tried lots of different things, but up until 2007, no one had thought, why don't we take a pinhole camera and just make it big? And you thought, oh, maybe you'd get very similar images, but you don't. None of these images look normal. And I think surrealists would very much enjoy this because I'm sure they would derive some meaning out of this. And it is definitely not capturing life as it normally is. Um, I really enjoy these images. I think they're really interesting. And it really shows how exploring experimental photography and seeing how far you can push the limits sometimes means pushing the equipment, actually advancing photography as a whole completely. So, yeah, really interesting. Um, cool. There it is again. So the last part I want to talk about is where are we at with experimental photography now? So other photo editing programs are available, but if any of you have ever used Lightroom or Photoshop, um, can you consider yourself an experimental photographer? Most people probably would use it and at the end of the day you are changing an image, editing an image and very at the beginning of this talk one of the def defining features of experimental photography was that you're doing something upon the image that changes it from its original state by editing it and this is stuff that pictorialists would have done that Dardais did and Surrealists did as well. So if you're editing an image by changing some of the colors, editing the position, cutting someone out, something like that. Are you an experimental photographer? Is that what the digital age is now? Is all photography experimental photography? It's quite deep, but if we're defining experimental photography as changing an image, then surely we change images all the time. Even on things like Instagram, if we just change the lighting or the tone a little bit, is that experimental photography? So I imagine many people would probably think no, because you can still take a very good image and change the tones to just make the image look better. In the traditional sense, that might be experimental. So what is it that makes photography different now? What advances it? What makes it more unique? So is it about perspective? Is it about set and costume? Is it about the things you add into the image apart from the image itself? So I'm gonna talk about, again, a bit biased, but one of my favorite photographers, Tim Walker. He's a fashion photographer and he shoots on medium format film. And his work is very much about 
the perspective, the set, and the costume. He's very much a commercial photographer. Um, but as you can see, he very much is utilizing the fisheye lens, as he did he shot Harry Styles' album cover. And with Tim Walker, it is very much about perspective, yeah, perspective shifting, as much as it is about the costumes, how elaborate they are, different effects he's adding in with sort of smoke in the background done on set. The behind the scenes of this image is that it was shot in a studio with a white background, but these trees and ferns you can see in the background are actually added in. So again, there's a degree of editing as well going on. And if you were to see these in the magazine, um, as well as also this has been superimposed on as well, it's on her heel. If you would see these images in a fashion magazine, you'd think, oh, that's not quite what normal fashion photography is, or at least what you typically see in a lot of fashion magazines. So is this experimental because it's changing up the way we see the normal frame of photography? And again, according to the experimental definition, pictorialists, dados, surrealists, um, you are editing the image. So maybe this is experimental photography. He very much goes ham on the scenery and everything puts into it. This is one of my favorite because I'm just kind of baffled in general. But uh, yeah, very interesting. So um, another photographer I mentioned about that is a fashion photographer who's very much more in the digital age. Tim Walker sort of came about more in the early 2000s. Connor Cunningham, or Miss Condi as he's known online, is very much sort of 2016 onwards. So quite a more modern commercial photographer. And again, taking those ideas of superimposing, definitely very much color editing as well, and a bit of airbrushing going on as well. Um, it's about outfits, again, it's about perspective. And if you looked at this, imagine it in black and white, you could even see this, you might think this is a Dora Maar photo, or a surrealist photo from the 30s or the 20s. So is it about going further with color, perspective and costume and set? Or are these just harkened back to the beginnings of surrealism? Again, begging the question, do we have any more experimental photography? Has it ended? Are we just rehashing the same techniques? Can we advance any further unless we advance things like equipment or just make weird things like the pinhole camera or the 32,000 straw pinhole camera? Is it about color? Is it purely laying on the digital imagery and thinking, let's just completely mess this up for the sake of color? make it look interesting. These are some really interesting photos of South, uh, South Africa by Dylan Marsh in his a selection of photos called Fever Dream. And normal landscapes, but completely messed with the color. And these have been digitally edited because doing that on film, I have no idea how. But these are digitally edited photos. And the big question is it about editing colors? If you saw these in a travel magazine or a travel book, you'd like, well, first you probably think, where is that? That's not really anywhere. But there's something now a lot more dreamy and ethereal about this landscape than if it was just green and brown with rocks and grass. So it does give it a very much more interesting perspective. So maybe that is making it experimental photography. It's changed it, but it's also making it mean more. These are just some more photos. I particularly like how the foam in this looks very orange as well. Kind of make it look fantasy. Not as in the word fantasy, as in like a fantasy. That was bad. And just keep move on. Again, more images. It was like cherry aid, maybe. I'm just gonna stop. Um, <laughs> this is also by Dylan Marsh, but I put this in here because this is actually made of three images. Um, because it's a giraffe's body with a gazelle's head superimposed onto this very sort of desert ashy background. Um, this war won him the runner-up in a, I believe it was a 2020 Wildlife Photography Prize. Um, I think it was Art Photography Prize, but it had the theme of, it was the category of theme around wildlife. And it's quite interesting that an image that is basically nearly completely faked, um, or composed of multiple images like we saw with um, Henry Peach Robinson, and that seven image, one image, um, that it can win prizes as well, which is giving more to the idea that experimental photography has been now nearly completely recognized and accepted, um, or in all its techniques accepted into the standard gallery competition traditions of photography. So I just thought it was an interesting image because it's harkening back to those techniques of superimposition, print combination, and there's probably a lot of uh, tonal editing going on there digitally as well. So it was very interesting. It's also very well blended. 
when I looked at that, I thought, what animal is that? And then for ages, I thought, wait, no, that's not a real animal. <laughs> so how can that be a real animal? Yeah, really interesting. Whoops. So again, Sophia will know this is also one of my favorite photographers. I mentioned Richard Mossy. Um, this is photographs of um, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, of a documentary Richard Mossy was making in 2012 um, called The Enclave, but the photo book he released with this was called Infra. Now, this isn't digitally edited. This is done with a particular film stock called Kodak Aerochrome. Kodak Aerochrome was used in the 60s by the American military and the CIA to detect um, bases in South American jungles because the unique thing about Kodak Aerochrome is that it doesn't pick up infrared the way around. It basically doesn't pick up the green in plants and it doesn't reflect the infrared light. We'll go with that. <laughs> basically, the green in plants does not show up and it only reflects the infrared. So when you look at plants, all you get is red. And I'd very much recommend going and watching a documentary that he made called The Enclave, which was about the, um, the war happening in the Congo at the time, the civil war that was occurring. And however much it is a documentary about a civil war, which is you know, awful, it has this very weird dream effect like you're in some sort of odd fantasy land because he decided to use Kodak Aerochrome for the whole thing. And all the greens and you know, the Congo being an extremely green jungle place, you know, there's lots of huge open fields, large tropical jungles and high grasslands, all of it being very deep greens. Um, seeing it all as this very cotton candy pink and red is extremely strange. And a lot of it as well reflect on the military garb of a lot of the soldiers. So again, is this what it means to be experimental? To take subjects and topics that we might see as one way and looking at a different side of it or completely altering the way we see it. Watching this documentary, you kind of get the sense you are kind of watching a weird fancy dream. And I guess that harkens back to Eugene Agitet, who was taking those street photographs and capturing the things maybe you're not meant to be looking at, like those people looking at eclipse, but he took the photo of them looking at the eclipse, not the eclipse itself. There's another image there as well. Bit of a self plug, this is my image. <laughs> just, um, I'm very much an advocate of the experimental surrealism side. So I do a lot of gig photography um, and I do send the bands actual decent gig photos so they enjoy it. But I've been really happy to see that some of the bands actually use the more experimental ones I do. So this was blurring it with dehazing effects and adding a lot of artificial colour. The lighting was not like this at the actual event. It was very much a lot more pale. Um, but I very much beefed up the colours and messed with them a lot because I really think it kind of gives it a new look now completely. Um, what might have been quite a not very amazing and boring image before, um, I actually think now has now a different perspective and a completely different meaning and sense after adding artificial colour and me giving it a very much dreamlike effect. And I'm very much an advocate that experimental photography can really do this. It really does change how you view an image, which was the whole point of surrealism. It's what they wanted from it. And yeah, I think you probably see this in a lot of different photos today, especially from a lot of different band photographers as well. So maybe experimental is just becoming a norm. So maybe there isn't experimental anymore. <laughs> Not plugging the bands. Maybe there's another. And a, there's another. I was wanting to talk very, very briefly about what I also think pushes the experimental more is about medium. So again, going back to Richard Moss, Mossy, uh, this is another project he did in 2017 called Incoming. And it was about uh, refugees and refugee crisis of, I can't remember the country, unfortunately, but I think it was in general about the refugee crises that happen. And of course, we're seeing another one now in Ukraine. Um, but he wanted to capture it from the way that unfortunately the West might perceive these crises in that we kind of see these images on the news and stuff about uh, refugees fleeing their countries, but we don't always just associate with the people and think how it's affecting them. We might just see a crowd of people running from a war or a conflict. And so Richard Moss tried to capture that effect of the West not really seeing these people for who they are properly or seeing them as individuals whose lives are being threatened. And 
try to show them as how we actually get shown them in the West. Most of the footage comes from shaky camera footage or military footage from drones. And so all of this project was shot on a military grade thermal camera. And it gives the dual effect of giving us the perspective perhaps we're unfortunately used to seeing these situations, but it also gives the effect of not really giving any of these individuals a proper face. You can't make out, you can make out some basic features, but you can't really make out their general look. You can't give them an expression if they're feeling sad, happy. I imagine they're not happy, but you can't give them personality or much humanity in a sense. And I think that's a really good one as well, in that you can't really see anyone's face properly. You have an idea of the scene and what's going on, but you don't really know how anyone's feeling about it because you can't tell. And that's really good and really, I think, talks about how we see these sort of situations in the West. So I was questioning that does the medium, i.e. an integrated thermal camera in this case, is this what makes experimental photography now? Do we need to find new ways to capture images that both give it meaning, but also give it an actual aesthetic that relates to the project's theory or the project's you know, ethos or point. And of course that's perhaps what some photographers can do, but not all of us have access to military gauge cameras. And perhaps some of us just have access to, to myself, just sort of entry level digital cameras. So is this really what it means to be experimental? Do we have to push boundaries this far or can we simply just change some colours and it changes the meaning? And I think really at the end of it, all of it can. It doesn't really matter which route you go down. It doesn't even really matter if you don't want to edit it that much. I think even something as cropping or perspective changing can change an image's meaning completely and take it away from what it originally was. And so I think all of that really gives what experimental photography is. So yeah, kind of begs that last question. So where are we now? Does in this digital age where you can edit anything and you see editing from Instagram, Facebook, you know, people getting cropped out of images, people getting airbrushed, especially, you know, Instagram models or celebrities airbrushing themselves all the time, or to big tonal edits on really big photography projects and things that take months to edit and go through a whole book because you want to make it look just right. Is that all experimental? Is it all experimental now? Have the boundaries been completely collapsed and what is traditional photography? And can we now consider it all experimental or avant-garde, as it's probably called now? And I think at the end of it, it's really about what you consider experimental because I think the whole point of surrealism at the end of the day was to find meaning in the photos you take and go into the unconscious and what because ultimately your unconscious will dictate what you see in the photo. So if that's the point, then surely the photos you're taking now are based on your unconscious and how you see them. So maybe you're all just engaging in surrealism at the end of the day. So I think maybe if you want to try it out, Try changing some colours, try cropping things, try taking a photo from an angle that doesn't quite make sense. Um, from an anecdotal point of view, when I did gig photography, I tend to think that just taking typical gig photos in black and white kind of got a bit boring and I wasn't that interested. But when I started blurring them and adding different colours, it made the photos feel different. It gave the event new life and it gave the bands sort of their own personality depending on what colours and effects I used. So I think really as in the sense of what Andrew Breton probably would have thought in that really experimental photography means whatever you want it to mean at the end of the day, which I suppose also at the end of this talk kind of just makes that whole talk sound a bit BS and pointless <laughs> because I've not really made a point. But I think the actual point is that at the end of the day, everything we do now is quite surrealist in photography. So I think now you've kind of seen where the, how the boundaries have been changed and where we are now in the modern boundaries and they're quite obscure, um, I think that just leaves more space to push it even further with weird equipment, weirder effects, and just take the photo and make it how you want to make it. Because back in the days of pictorialism and realism, all the photos they were taking would have been weird to photographers at the time, and now it's the norm. So how far can you push it to become the norm? Join up, become a member. Here are our nice little membership subscriptions you can have. Very nice. Please consider becoming a member. It really helps us and supports. And it's uh, just good to see you guys' faces and people interested. And engage with us. If you have any work you maybe work that is on the experimental side that you want to share, or you just want to try and improve your photography and want some feedback on it, or want to try and improve in general, 
engage with us, share your work, send us a message on any of our social medias or email us some of your work, tell us about your favorite photos. We have meetups hopefully coming soon as well, some more meetups. Um, so when we announce the dates and places for those, bring your favorite photographic book, your favorite photo, show us your equipment. We just want to see everything related to photography. We're, okay, I'm not going past it. There's our email. There's a nice QR code to take you to our link tree. I hope that is the link tree QR code. It is. Okay, <laughs> good. Um, feel free to get a photo of that. Uh, but it's all over our social medias as well, all our posts. And you can find our link tree linked to our social medias. And uh, yeah, this is the lovely team Ali, Sophia, Sophie, Dom, and Michal. Unfortunately, couldn't be here tonight. There's my dumb thing. So yeah, feel free to just come and have a chat with us after about if you want to know anything more about focus events and yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Everyone's just still staring. I mean if this is the end, there's no more. <laughs> <Long call. laughs> no more.